Welcome listeners uh, to the podcast. I'm Lawrence Yang, your host. I'm a family physician in Surrey, British Columbia. I also have a big interest in quality improvement. Um, and here with me are my friends from Interior Health. We have Dr. Marianne Morgan. Marianne, you're a family doc out in, um, is it Kelowna? Yeah. yeah. That, yep, that's correct. That's correct. And uh, Jessica, you're are you a nurse out there? Uh, in Kelowna as well? I am, yep. I'm a nurse is my background, but right now I'm a clinical operations manager. Mm, clinical here in operations Kelowna too. manager. Yep. Um, Marianne, let's uh, start with you. What got you into healthcare, Marianne? What got me into healthcare? It was a long, twisty, turny road to get me into healthcare, uh, trying various things um, along my learning journey. Um, but once I got into family practice, um, I never looked back. I have loved it. And the most, Im not the most important, but some of the critical parts that, that I've found in my practice is um, both birth and death. So mm -hmm. um, I gave up my practice a couple of years ago to um, somebody who came to town and we need more physicians. Um, but I'm continuing to be part of our obstetrics group and I'm continuing to be part of our palliative group. And on reflecting on that a little bit, I think it's um, because both of those groups work in teams and that's re been really fulfilling mm -hmm. and rewarding. And I think that's how joy and work ties in as well. Yeah, I, I can see that, that the working in teams where you feel supported is such a big part of feeling sustainable in healthcare, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. And, and you work in, uh, so you, you've, you've uh, focused your current practice on um, delivering babies and helping people in their, in their last days of transition. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, how about you, Jessica? Um, what got you into healthcare? I also had a bit of a twisty journey to get here. Um, and, and, you know, I was just kind of dabbling and, and not sure where I wanted to go. But when I hit on kind of the sciences and the people side of it, I thought nursing might be the way to go. Um, I remember, honestly, that first week of nursing school, I thought, this is it. I'm so glad that I applied to be a nurse. And that whole four years really solidified it for me. I had a twisty, turny journey and kind of also nursing. That's what I love about nursing is you can kind of dabble in various um, kind of specialties and fields, but really when I hit palliative care, that was also the moment for me um, that I said, like, this is where I need to be as a nurse. I had worked, you know, medical, surgical, community, kind of all over, um, worked a lot in global health, but wherever I landed in palliative care, I always sought out palliative care patients, even on medical units and surgical units. And I was like, I'm going to be the one, you know what? give me that, that palliative patient, but it just really felt like I was my best nurse when I was nursing as a palliative care um, nurse. And it was the relationships. It was being able to spend time with the patients and the families. It was easing suffering. It was living until death. Um, it was, you know, making the best of what can be hard moments. Um, and then kind of segueing into an opportunity to be the, I was the clinical operations uh, manager for palliative care services for two or three years as well. Um, and that just was a great opportunity for me to kind of lead a team that I had been, you know, nursing at, in a frontline capacity with. Um, and like Marianne said, I feel like the palliative care team is probably one of the best teams I've had the pleasure of being a part of. Um, truly interdisciplinary, truly collaborative. Um, and it was, that was re really my first experience as a nurse where I thought, wow, like, look at me, I'm working alongside the physician. I'm working alongside the social worker. Um, and together we're trying to, you know, make this journey the best for this patient and family right now. Yeah, there, I think there, I think palliative care attracts a, a certain, certain characteristic of a, a, a type of healthcare worker, you know, definitely someone who is really compassionate. I, I can see that because, you know, we're no longer striving for that ideal of let's let's live the longest life we can. Um, yeah. And we're not doing things that are uh, super aggressive in terms of yeah. um, interventions in medical care. And it really is just about comfort and yeah, and living the best life you can, you know, 
Like that is to me is truly like we're able to have those conversations with the patients and families and, and, you know, hear, listen and hear what it is they truly want and orientate that whole team towards what their goals are. Mm. Speaking of the best life, um, how did you get into QI, Jessica, like quality improvement in healthcare? Uh, how did that come onto your plate? I'm going to say Marianne landed that one on my plate. I mean, I had I had also dabbled a little bit in quality improvement, just in kind of various leadership roles, um, to, you know, being a part of QI projects or being a part of lean management, like some of those kind of strategies, but never truly leading a project until I was the manager for palliative care services and Marianne being the director of, of palliative care also for the Central Okanagan. You know, we had we had been working together frontline and then we were working together as leaders and we had really been seeing a lot of compassion fatigue and burnout in our team and trying to think about how do we address this you know we've been hearing it we're seeing it we're feeling it ourselves also as clinicians and also leaders and what are we going to do so um, Marianne had seen an application for physician quality improvement this was in 2019 um, and this was the second cohort for interior health. And it was the first time that they were doing dyads. So it wasn't just the physician, but it was also, it was a physician paired with a, an operations lead. And so we thought, you know, why not apply to PQI and look at addressing compassion fatigue and burnout within our palliative care team through the lens of quality improvement. Um, so we wrote our application and we were accepted and we were really excited. Um, and at the time that, you know, it was a year long program, we were meeting face to face, we were meeting, you know, teams from all over the health authority. This was pre COVID times. Um, and our whole kind of pro project shifted and, and evolved. Um, and it was just a fantastic opportunity for Marianne and I to work together as colleagues, but really work together on this project that ended up evolving into a joy and work project. Mm. Now, Dr. Morgan, Marianne, can you speak to your origin story with, with quality improvement? Like what was your first exposure to QI science? In 2019, I was the department head at, uh, for family practice at Kelowna General. And I, th I think at the medical advisory level, we were hearing more and more about quality improvement and committees were shifting more in their quality approach. And I went to one of the PQI introductory sessions for the um, physician quality improvement sessions for interior health. And they were offering up this, why don't you come along and you got a great project. And Jess and I have been talking about what do we do with our workforce and our, our team members that are not doing well would this be an avenue for it so yeah that was my my first exposure i think mm -hmm. so it was around that time of joining the the pqi the physician quality improvement program where you really got to reflect on some of the tools in quality improvement yeah yeah we both found it a really awesome program we lucked out being in person at that point and hopefully most of them have gone back to that because mm -hmm. i think that was key um, to be able to work with all of the other teams from around your health authority, learning from each other. And then we had um, great support and coaches. Mm. Um, and we can talk more about our specific project um, and, and how that worked as well. But yeah, that's PQI was our, our way in together. Mm -hmm. There's definitely something to be said about being co-located with clinicians, colleagues of all different specialties in the same room and, and sharing your challenges and then sharing some of your ideas and solutions. There's, it's an ins inspiring space, isn't it? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Learning from each other. And I, I think everything was much richer and people shared ideas that maybe didn't work for them, but you grabbed it and went, Oh yeah, this works for us. Thanks. Here, why don't you try this? And yeah, <laughs> lots of, lots of great sharing and communication. And, and I think building some relationships that still um, mm -hmm. exist from different parts of the health authority too. You know, for me, there's a lot of joy in that type of connection, that social connection, that camaraderie and, and sharing. I'll start with you, Dr. Morgan. What what does joy in work mean to you? I, I know it means something different to each person. So what, is, what, what does it mean to you? 
Well, Joy, when we started the PQI project, I hadn't really heard about Joy and Work. Um, but just after we got approved, and I think about the first weekend we were doing the, the PQI project, that Joy and Work um, from the Doctors of BC came across my desk saying, oh, come take this eight week uh, virtual course. And, and I think for sure at that point, I must have been somewhat burnt out because my response was, what a title, like what, how are they going to get anybody to come to something called Joy and Work, but I'm intrigued, I'll, I'll sign up. So I kind of did it alongside doing the PQI pro project. Um, so Joy and Work for me started as um, uh, the Institute for Health Improvement, I think coined the term. So they they own Joy and Work, I think, and learning about the framework and the white paper. And I think what was super helpful as we were struggling in our PQI project, feeling like we belonged, because um, we definitely felt like outliers, like we were this more kind of intangible, what were we going to do? It was, it was hard to figure out what our aim statement was, what were our our specific objectives. Um, the the information that I had collected and and shares is all about how effective um, joy and work and taking care of your workforce is in giving better patient care and looking after yourself and decrease sick time and all of those things that were like, oh, there's actually evidence out here that this is a good thing to do. So it was this kind of, okay, we're on the right track. This is this is good. So that was we started to collect um, frameworks and tools uh, to support our work. And that was one of them. Uh, very cool. So you mentioned the Institute of Healthcare Improvements uh, white paper. They have a, a Joy and Work white paper. And you can it's that's free to access for anybody who's on the web. They can just uh, Google Joy in Work white paper and you'll be able to find the PDF with that information. And it's really a conglomeration of research from many different health systems around what are some of the best practices for improving joy at work. Very cool. Uh, how about you, Jess? You, you mentioned that you know, you're a clinical operations leader and you got a, exposed to QI really in this, this experience called physician quality improvement where you're in a dyad partnership. So yeah. uh, cl clinician and operational leader paired together to work on, on this project, which evolved into a joy and work project. What what does that, what is joy, what did joy and work mean to you? And has it, has it shifted over, over the time? Yeah, it really has shifted. I mean, we've been, this has been like a five year evolution for Marianne and I and our teams that we've been working with and initially starting out with kind of looking at it from a lens of compassion, fatigue, and burnout, and then having, you know, in, in talking with our palliative care team, we were getting a lot of feedback to that you know, when we're looking at compassion, fatigue and burnout, it can be very individual. And often it feels like we're placing blame on ourselves or others. If, you know, we're not going to yoga, we're not doing mindfulness, we're not doing this, you know, these type of wellness strategies. Um, and, and I'm the reason why I'm burnt out. But when we started looking at it and listening in, in to our team and looking at it from our own perspectives, we started to, you know, look into concepts of moral distress, where it's like the systems approach and, and looking at, you know, the systems impact of how that's impacting you um, and your inability to to find joy at work. And when we started shift or when Marianne was taking that joy and work course, it was starting to shift our mindset into more of like that positive deviance or that asset based approach um, into finding the glimmers of hope in the day or the glimmers of joy in the day and reorientating ourselves around the team. Um, so still looking at like the individual side of things. Yes, we all have, you know, pieces of this, but how can we as a team best support one another? How can we develop more resiliency to ride these waves of these highs and lows that we continue to face? Um, and how can we find these moments of joy in the day? Um, and I took the Joy and Work course a couple of years ago, after, actually, um, and I would highly recommend that course to anybody if you're looking for kind of the strategies. So it's about an eight week course through IHI. Um, you're with people from around the world who are taking this. They're kind of walking you through the white paper, but you're they're really giving you kind of tangible ways to do this. Um, and 
I look at it as like a leadership approach for me now in my current, in my current work. It's how you show up in your day to day. It's how you ask questions to your team. It's how you're checking in. It's how you're listening. Um, and and it's, it's how you're kind of showing up. So yeah, it's been, it's been a cool journey. So what I'm hearing is that joy and work really is a combination of there's some in, in personal um, shifts and changes that we could do around our own wellness, but there's really uh, a re a reframe for many of us uh, to focus on what are the strengths within the system, within the team? What can we do as a team to be more sustainable? And what can we do as a team to change maybe how we're being or how we lead ourselves yep. and lead our teams that really that really is at the crux of the the changes that need to happen for joint work does that resonate yeah it's mm -hmm. about Definitely. i mean it, it talks a lot about they talk a lot about finding meaning and purpose um and i think you can do that as an individual but you can also do that as a team and you can also do it as you know a wider system or an organization and finding meaning and purpose in your day-to-day -day or the work that you're doing mm. Um, Marianne, I'd like to go back to you. You guys came up, you and Jessica together came up with a, a model, um, a joy and work model. Like, I don't know if it did, did this come up when you started working with uh, Dr. Leanne Martin and Dr. Daisy DeLay uh, in the context of spreading your, your joy and work project around the province? Is that how this joy and work maturity model came about? I, is yeah, that... I think it, it was our next level. So the, the, the things that had informed us with our own PQI project with our palliative care team were really the, um, the information we got from our, our coaches and our teams at the time, the join work framework. And then the other big one that spoke to us was the safety one, safety two frameworks um, about QI itself and how that impacts front lines. Um, and then I, and I think the other group that is we just heard about what the quality forum this past year, but the, the whole idea of the learning from excellence um, movement that's happening now that I'm hearing of some of our health authority folks adopting as well, which um, that same concept that you learn from works, what works well, as opposed to looking at the negatives. So that positive versus negative. So that was the other piece that we really um, took forward that, that, um, spoke to us with the team well being being in the quality. So then, yeah, so in a couple of years ago, two, three years ago now, um, when BC decided to try and spread some of these um, PQI projects that were all be, being done individually around the province, um, Interior Health put forward our project as one that um, could be tried to be spread to other groups. Um, and at the time, the big thing I think that appealed to interior health was that we decreased sick time in our hospice team um, with some of that information. So that appealed to them that th this did make a difference for, for teams and, and could affect things operationally. This is getting back to our team model. I'm getting there. Um, so then <laughs> when we sat down to think about, well, geez, how do we spread this? We know how to do this with our team that we've known for a long time. That's all works together interactively. How do we tell other teams how to do this? Um, and so we reviewed all the information we could find. We did literature searches and the IHI white paper um, and the teams like East London around the world that are, are doing things are great at all the individual measurements and engagement tools and really good at how you change the system and how you support front lines. But we couldn't find anything on how to be a team and how to engage and evaluate your team. And so that's where the team measure, I think our current title is the team well-being matrix. Um, so that's our, our latest, what, what do we call this, this table that we have? Um, so yes, it did start. Then we sat down, tried to make a change package because that would, all the SQI spread quality improvement teams were charged with making a change package, handing it over to your, your receiving sites. We were the sending site. And then they would go on and, and just replicate what you'd done. Um, but what we found was we weren't that typical kind of project where you'd actually replicate. You had to create your own 
Um, so when we sat down to make a change package, we ended up with just this giant list of all of these potential things and got so bogged down by the whole thing that we actually set it aside and got our teams all organized. And we are now just circling back to creating our change package. Now that we have more information, we've created this team model. Um, so I, that's the, that's the long-winded answer to the, how'd you get to your team model? Mm, thank you. Thanks, Marianne. Jessica, anything to add to that? Um, no, other than I think it was just born out of recognizing there was a gap, you know, the, the I high white paper talks about local level measures that you can use for measuring joy and work. I mean, how do you measure joy? It's, it's a really kind of challenging and multifactorial concept to begin with. So there's no really single measure that you can use. Um, so they recommend various local level measures that you can try. So for example, good day, bad day is a strategy that they, they kind of suggest that you can use where you have your teams or individuals within teams measuring their day. They can plunk a little, you know, coin or a pebble in a, in a jar that says I had a good day or I had a bad day. Um, and you can take some of that data. You can make a lovely run chart. You can get a sense of where the team is at. So that's an example of like a local level measure that you can use through join work. And then there's like systems level measures like Marianne was talking about within our palliative care team, over the course of our project, we saw that our sick time went down about 50% over that project year. So that's like a great systems level measure. So sick time, overtime, work safe BC claims, those are some things that you can kind of measure along the way. But we just didn't see a, a way that you could measure from a team perspective. Um, so that was where this, yeah, our, our matrix, our team well-being matrix was kind of forged out of, was a gap. Um, and so much of the joy and work, work is about co-creation and engaging. Um, and we just felt like this matrix that we're kind of presenting is a way actually, not only to measure, but it's a way to engage. It's a way to start a conversation um, with your team. And it's a way to kind of check in and say, you know, where are we at? Um, can, how can we get from a team that's unaware to a team that's knowing or capable? Um, and it's an opportunity to talk. Are you able to share on screen the, the team well-being matrix? Because I don't know if, I don't think the listeners have seen it yet. That would be really cool. Yeah, I can pull that up. And just while Jessica's pulling it up, um, and the other thing that occurs to me is we were rereading the literature, um, Amar Shah, who's been um, amazing with the East London work, uh, put out a series of papers last year that talked about um, survey fatigue and the burden of trying to actually collect data from your front lines. Um, and really surveys has been the, the main thing. And do you create apps for people to give their feedback um, and then people don't necessarily fill them out and and how this was a need and a, and a miss in, in a measurement tool. So. Um, another bit of information for us that went, oh, here's, here's our measurement tool, because you can, you can use it in, it can be all kinds of measurements. It can be an output um, or an outcome measure, a balancing measure, a process measure, um, each or all three at the same time. So mm -hmm. I'll let Jessica share it here and walk you through. Awesome. Yeah, we can see it. Um... Yeah, you know, walk us walk us through this if you can, Jessica. Sure. So we originally kind of based this off a maturity model. So kind of that step measurement where you're reading from kind of left to right. So in the purple, this is this is a team. So again, we're this is looking from a team perspective and a team on a journey of joy in work and well-being. So a team that's kind of in this unaware phase, moving all the way up into the sustain. And you can see within the various columns, so the unaware, explore, know, capable, and sustain, you've got various categories. Um, and the categories are how you may feel as an individual and also how the team may feel and act as well. So there's kind of two parts to that. So you can see that first um, category is my inner voice says. So in the unaware, you are just kind of getting through the day. But when you're in more of that capable and sustain, it's my inner voice is saying, I enjoy coming to work and my work has meaning and purpose. 
Um, another example, I guess, of a category is the joy journey. So this is how a team is kind of moving through a quality improvement journey. So in this unaware, you're kind of that rigid, inflexible system and change is feeling hard, change is feeling like a burden to the team. And then you move along and, you know, quality improvement just becomes a way of being. Um, the team was working together on projects and then it just becomes where quality, QI is just your daily practice. Change is great. Change is exciting and positive and the team is, is just kind of craving that. Um, and Again, average day feels you're moving from an impossible, just trying to get through your day all the way into feeling really optimistic and fulfilled at the end of your day. And, you know, we're also saying this, these are just suggestions. You could take this to your team and you could actually use this could be blank and your team, you could use it as more like a team canvas and you could populate it with language that works for you and your team. Um, so yeah, it's just it's just a way to create some dialogue. It's a way to engage and it's a way to measure your journey throughout along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, what a fantastic framework to to get conversations going like you like you'd said earlier that this can just be a conversation starter or yeah. it can be used as part of a survey or as a as a, yeah. as a self assessment. Yeah. That's yeah. Fantastic. I mean, we're learning with teams from Fraser Health have actually, you know, kind of made this into a survey so that you know, unaware is is one and then sustain is five. And so, you know, measuring that along the way. So you have a bit more of a quantitative way to um, you mm. know, put forward how the team is, how the team is doing. Um, and then qualitatively, yeah, you can measure it just with, you know, what people are saying. Um, so I think there's, there's multiple ways that you can use this. That's awesome. Um, Marianne, anything to add as, as, you listen to Jessica present this uh, model that you co-created. Uh, I, I think I would also give kudos to um, Leanne and Daisy, our physician um, supporters, leads. I don't know what their official title is through well, SSC. Their official title is um, <laughs> co-lead of spread quality improvement, of spreading quality improvement in the province. Okay. Yeah. Under doctors. Um, they have hugely helpful and supportive of our spread work within interior health um they do learning sessions they they have done learning sessions with each of the different sqi projects around the province and i don't know how it went with all of the other teams but for us they totally redid their learning sessions and their slide decks um to really look more at joy and work and safety too and leading from excellence um and incorporated um tools like ours um into that work so that um, as our three teams within our group are working along, it's a combination of um, everything Leanne and Daisy know, so, um, supported by their learnings, and we all of our um, combined learnings together. Mm. Thank you. If if the listeners want to learn more about um, safety one, safety two, um, or or about um, learning from excellence, kind of assets and strengths-based approaches and what are some resources you might recommend that they look into if you google learning from excellence you'll go straight to the website that um and then there's a great little paper that the plunkets wrote there's a husband and wife i believe their husband and wife um mm. specialist couple from britain um wrote a paper about three years ago and I, i'd have to look it up but it's just a great um, summary on all the different ways you can bring positive deviance and asset-based uh, work into quality improvement and team approach. And then Safety One, Safety Two was put forward by Whole Nagel. If you Google Whole Nagel, H-O-L-L-N-A-G-E-L, -L -L -E you'll, you'll get the original paper. That's um, H-O-L-L-N-A-G-E-L. Hall, Eric. H -L -L -N -A -G -E -L. E -L. Okay. And you get I, his paper. Anything you'd add there, Jessica? And, or you can yeah, reach out to one of us because we've got. This is the power of the dyad research. partnership. <laughs> I've got the article is for the Plunkett article that Marianne was referring to. It's positive approaches to safety, learning from what we do well. Um, I agree. It's a fantastic article that summarizes just you know, from ex-novation, which is the, also a cool topic, um, 
and it, it, yeah, all the, all of the pieces about being asset based, which and reframing um, that really fits with the joy and work kind of mentality. And the whole Nagel article is from 2015 and it, it's a white paper. It's a white paper from about safety too. And the whole kind of journey, I mean, really it's about, it's, it, it talks about the journey and pa patient safety from being in safety one and looking at the deficits and looking for, you know, the one thing in 99 that went wrong um, in shifting into the safety two mindset, which is looking at asset based and looking at the 99 things that went right. Mm. What a lovely message. Um, you, you mentioned Marianne that people could contact you uh, if, if they were interested, how, how might they reach you? I'll start with you, Marianne, and then I'll go to Jessica. Um, probably my interior health email would be great. So Marianne.Morgan at interiorhealth.ca. No, that's M-A-R-I-A-N-N-E dot M-R-G-A-N at interiorhealth.ca. Yeah. Um, how about you, Jessica? Are you open to people reaching out to you? Absolutely. Yep. So same for me. So Jessica.Barker at interiorhealth.ca. That's great. Um, anything else you guys want to add before we close up the conversation? I think I would add that this work is hard. Mm. And this work can be tough. You, you know, if, if you're following kind of the joy and work steps, which start with, you know, asking what matters to you and what are the pebbles in your shoes and what are the things that we can work on as a team, you're going to hear some tough stuff, especially as a leader. And, um, and, and it's, you have, you kind of have to be ready for it. Um, and you have to be ready to navigate that with, with you and your team. Um, staffing issues are always going to come up <laughs> that the team wants to change or deal with. And that might not be within your span of control. But I think my advice is to look at what is in your span of control. Your span of control as a leader, your span of control as a team, and really focus on some of those things first. You also need engagement from senior leaders in this. Um, and that was part of our journey as well, is making sure that we were doing presentations to our senior executive team, that they were, you know, we had quality improvement leaders engaged from within interior health and provincially. Um, and that was has been really important in our journey for kind of moving things along and are important for breaking down some of those barriers. And also when some of these larger issues are coming up within a team, that the team is feeling like they're being heard and that these issues are being presented, you know, at levels where they can be actioned um, because that's what, that's what it takes is, is showing to the teams that we're hearing them and we are actioning these things that they're bringing forward. So it's, it, it, and you need a buddy. Like, I think this, again, we talk about the power of dyads, like, to know that I have Marianne in this is huge. It has been a journey of ups and downs. Um, and there's times when we've absolutely wanted to quit or throw in the towel, but here we are. <laughs> and wow. I think it's it's truly is because we, we do have each other. And when one of us is feeling the low, the other person can say, okay, let's look at the positive in this, or let's just keep you know on this. Um, and yeah, that's been a huge part of why we're still here. I think there's there's so many lessons in what you just shared that, that each of us has to find our sphere of influence and accept uh, the yeah. you know where, what we can do within that sphere of influence, understanding what we can control and what we can't, and not getting bogged down by the, all the myriad of different things in the larger system, and recognize that our influence sometimes is is all that we need to 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 focus on. Um, yeah. Marianne, any challenges of of executing on joint work that, that you can think of that you'd like to share with listeners? I think the last thing I'd share is it just takes time in this work as well. So don't expect quick results. And I think sometimes you can feel pressured within an operations world that, well, where's your data? Where's your information that you've improved things? Um, and it, it sometimes takes time. And sometimes, um, and I think the the IHI information and probably you'd, you've experienced this, Lawrence, with your joy and work work is sometimes things get worse before they get better. If you if you ask people what matters to them and how they are, um, sometimes that that can create havoc to begin with, but sometimes you need to, mm -hmm. to, to hear everything that's going on 
and and create the chaos before you can you can heal the the team it's it's really interesting i, I love how you use the, the term heal the team because it really is healing uh be, when i work with my patients as a family physician often what i try to do is create a container a space and container for them to offload their worries and their burdens because their psychological emotional physical physical challenges that they're suffering from if they they're held too tightly within the body and they haven't let them out it causes physical symptoms it really does and i think that even the work in palliative care is about you're, you're creating safe spaces of comfort for for humans to offload things that that are bothering them and in the joint work space you're creating containers and spaces where people can speak some of the things that they have not felt listened to about. And as you said, Jessica, people need to be heard and validated to feel safe. And once they feel safe, improvement and changes can happen. Wow. Uh, I just want to thank you both for this uh, wonderful work. Anything else to add before we close out the show? Thanks for your time. <laughs> thank you guys Thanks for your time. Trust. I hope people are going to reach out to you. I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs>